Let's talk about a story that nobody wants to talk about. Chinese organ trafficking. Bet you didn't see that coming. Well, I guess unless you read the title to this, uh, this video, that is. Now I caught wind of this story during my time at the University of Oregon because there was these ladies that were handing out flyers probably every week or every other week. And the flyers were talking about Chinese organ trafficking. Originally when I heard this story, I thought it was like some conspiracy theory and I was very confused about it. However, because of these ladies, and they were from China, they literally came here and lived here and started to try to bring awareness to this issue, I decided to do some digging. So thank you, old Chinese ladies, for doing your part, and I shall do mine right now. So let's jump into it. According to NBC, the organs of members of marginalized groups detained in Chinese prison camps are being forcefully harvested, sometimes when patients are still alive, an international tribunal sitting in London has concluded. So pretty much what's going on is that there's this tribunal that launched this study about the Chinese organ harvesting industry. I read the study. If you would like to check it out, I have all my information in the description box below. But pretty much what happened is that the study conclusively said, yes, the Chinese government is literally helping this industry where they take organs from marginalized groups and they're selling these organs on the black market. And so the, what gets a little bit more twisted is how many victims are actually affected. So let me just stop you right here in this video and let me ask you, how many people do you think is affected by this? We're talking about the Chinese prison system specifically with the minorities. 500 people a year, 1,000, 10,000, 50,000, what? Ready for this? 1.5 million people. It is a billion dollar industry in China and it is not being challenged right now. Now in these cases too, it's nearly impossible to figure out exactly how many people have been affected by this. The reason is because the Chinese government is really good about concealing information from anybody who could probably help the situation. And so that's kind of why we're left a little stumped as to how many people, but we can say at least 1.5 million people, at very least. To ramp the story up even more, you might be wondering why are they targeting minority groups? Well, number one, because they're the most vulnerable, and number two, it's the type of people in these minority groups. There's two that are primarily targeted. Number one, there's the Muslim Uyghurs, and number two, there's the Falun Gong people. Now, real quick on the Falun Gong, so essentially what it is, is it's a spiritual and movement practice meant to connect a person with their inner energy. It started to gain momentum into the 1990s before the Chinese government cracked down on it. And so the Chinese government labeled it originally as a heretical cult and banned the practice altogether. One reason why the Chinese communist government likely banned the practice was because the Chinese government was supporting secularism, specifically focusing on science and economic development. And as opposed to in the West, where there's like a separation between church and state, but you have the ability to be able to practice your religion. And then China at that time, it was viewed as threatening to the Chinese government because there's a wave of support for something that isn't directly in line with the Chinese government's ideology. And so therefore they started to crack down. Now, going full circle back to my rhetorical question about why these minority groups are targeted, one potential reason is because of their clean diets. They don't drink, they eat cleanly. And so the organs are literally viewed as having a higher quality and so they can sell them for more money. You know, <laughs> there's times now where I feel like I'm just not shocked by things in life. And then I hear about things like this and it really takes me back. And I have to just sit back and I'm like, wow, it's impressive on how horrible that is. Like really, that is so bad considering the fact that this is through a government, especially the government that the United States is directly pairing with in the international trade economy. But anyway, I digress. What also makes this interesting is that in 2012, the Chinese government admitted to taking organs. However, they said that they had taken it from executed criminals and not from people who were alive, let alone people who were persecuted because of their religion and then literally the organs were taken from them while they were alive, this was in fact the case and they did die as a result of this. There's multiple reports on this by the United Nations and Human Rights Watch. So if you'd like to check it out, I have a lot of information on that in the description box below. China also said that they're going to phase out the practice in five years. And so they were apparently supposed to phase this out in 2017. However, the study that I had referred to earlier on in the episode, that was a study from 2019. So they're clearly still doing it. Here's where it gets even crazier. Let's jump into how China could actually stop a country from stepping in. And so I wanna talk about rules and regulations on an international scale. I don't really wanna talk about how China could say, launch economic retaliation or shifts in regional balances of power. 
um, against countries that try to fight back against them. Let's just focus specifically on international rules and regulations and how China is manipulating that system in order to make sure that they're not persecuted as a result. So China is a part of the United Nations Security Council, and pretty much what this means is that they are one of five countries that are permanently on the Security Council. Other countries kind of rotate through, so sometimes they are on the Security Council, and maybe a few years later they might be on the Security Council again. But essentially what this means is that they have veto power to stop resolutions. So this is the same thing that the United States does to make sure that we're not persecuted for crimes against humanity for the war in Iraq. This is what the Russians do, specifically in the Soviet Union. Even France and some of those other countries do it as well. And so this is what China is currently doing to make sure that they don't get punished. Pretty much what a country would have to do is that they would have to go through the Security Council and then from that point onwards they have to create a case and then send it to the International Criminal Court. However, if you are the United States or if you're Russia or if you're China, you can literally stop any sort of resolution. So if someone says, hey, I would like to launch an investigation against China, China could say, no, you're not. And then the other country would have to say, you're right, we're not, the end. However, I don't really give a shit. Let's talk about the specific human rights that China is violating. First things first, Article 3, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. It's kind of hard to have your security of person when you're getting your organs taken. Article 5, no one shall be subjected to torture or cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment or punishment. It's kind of hard to do when you get your organs taken. Article 7, all are equal before the law and are entitled without any discrimination to equal protection of the law. Well, I mean, if you're a religious person getting your organs taken because of your religious affiliation, it's kind of hard to make the argument that Article 7 doesn't in fact play some role into this. Now I could keep going, but I think we got the point here. The question that we now have to ask ourselves is, why would any sort of international body actually give a few countries the ability to be able to veto decisions that would affect them. Funny story for you guys, I had a fascinating conversation once with somebody who actually worked for the United Nations and I asked them this very question. Here's literally what he said, quote, how else would you get powerful countries to agree to join a group of less powerful countries? Damn it, that's a good point. So starting in World War II all the way back in the day, there was the countries that won the war and the countries that lost. Back in the day, it was more normal for countries, the most powerful countries, to impose themselves on the losers. So at that time when the United Nations was created, it was very difficult to try to get the most powerful countries to join a group with the less powerful countries. It's like, hey, we're like the popular kids in the corner and you guys are all the losers who we just beat up. Why would we join a group with you? And that's where the incentives were created, which is the United Nations Security Council for five different countries. Now to be very clear, I don't support the fact that these countries have this type of perk because it defeats the point. Like, what is the point of a security council if you can't prosecute people who are on the security council? So you can prosecute everybody else, but just not them? Like, how does that work? Especially considering the fact also that countries use their position within the security council to vow for other countries, like the United States with like Israel, for example, so they don't get convicted of war crimes. So I don't have a better position for you guys. I don't have a better like recommendation. I'm just letting you know that this is in fact the case. So what do we do? Spread information about this topic. That is all. Because a majority of the world doesn't even know that this issue exists. And you can't solve a problem if you don't know it exists. 